This is a University of Otago podcast. About going to university and some of the changes there have been in going to university and to invite you to think about your own experiences of going to university and how, how those might compare and contrast with those of the students that you work with now. Uh, I've been to uh, four different tertiary institutions and um, studied you know, four different qualifications. The first one um, was, was here. Uh, I went to Queen's High School and when I left Queen's High School um, at 18, I enrolled uh, at Otago University. The hardest thing about that was that uh, at orientation people would say, where are you from? And I'd say Dunedin and they'd go, what, really? <laughs> <laughs> and even see that the um, Otago University marketing these days ha has the students saying, you know, Diane Hamilton education. but. Um, People actually found it quite difficult at orientation to believe that I was a local. And uh, for a while I lived at home. Uh, and then I went flatting. And so going to university for me at the age of 18 meant I would tumble out of bed in my, uh, my flat in Grange Street and uh, just walk down the end of the street and into the lecture theatre by 9am, usually. Uh, so that was the first four years um, for my BA Honours in Education. And then I went down the road to what was then Dunedin College of Education and um, did a, a, a grad course uh, for a couple of years to become um, a primary school teacher. And then that was really tough because at the College of Education, you didn't just tumble out of bed and go to a lecture, they made you go all day. And sometimes in midwinter, they made you start at 8 a.m. They had these things called 8 a.m. lectures. And that was really tough because sometimes it wasn't light in Dunedin <laughs> midwinter at 8 a.m., you know, and so it was, it was tough going. And also as part of learning to become um, a primary school teacher, I had to go to schools as well um, and do practicum experiences. I think they were called placements or sections uh, in those days. And I, I do have rather fond memories of trying really hard for a number of hours to get to school, um, uh, school up in Wakari, uh, when it was a snow day. It was very difficult to get up the hill, even when I was walking, without chains on my boots. Uh, so when I finished there, I, I went up to Auckland and worked as a primary school teacher and did my master's degree part-time uh, through uh, Auckland University, that one. And so going to university for me was a bit like this. It was about crossing the bridge. Um, I taught in a digital classroom on the North Shore. Going to university in Auckland meant that on a one night a week, I would get in my car and drive over the bridge for like a three hour interactive lecture tutorial combo. And uh, then I'd get back in my car and drive back over the bridge and that was going to university. So I can't tell you a lot about what student life was like or the culture of Auckland University because I haven't really seen much of the campus. I've seen the inside of the Wilson car park building and a couple of rooms where we did our um, part-time master's study at the time. When I finished that, I, um, I decided that uh, I would move to Hamilton and, uh, you know, had a, got a job there as a lecturer and part of the deal was you will, and it was actually written on the letter, you will make satisfactory progress towards your doctor, doctorate as part of being here at our university. So that was my fourth qualification, my fourth university was the University of Waikato where I did my part-time ED studies and then going to university was a lot like going to work. It's in between marking and administration and all the other things that you do as a lecturer, I would just um, try to do some research and for some of the time that research would be um, my doctoral studies and my supervisors were senior colleagues and I'd meet with them in their offices on campus. So that was going to university, it was going to work really. So those four experiences were all quite different at different stages of my life and different stages of my career. Uh, they didn't really involve a lot of distance education unless you count the drive over the bridge. Uh, and so when I found myself teaching online um, from the first year when I moved to 
uh, Waikato, it was a very different experience indeed. But I had the great fortune to teach um, alongside uh, Nola Campbell, who a lot of you will know. Um, she's a, a nationally renowned person who um, sadly passed away in 2005, but before she did, I taught with her and she taught me pretty much everything I know about um, distance education and learning online. Um, one of the qualifications that we, we teach uh, at Waikato is called the Mixed Media Program, or MMP, and it's, a, it's basically online initial teacher education where you can qualify as a primary teacher or early childhood or secondary these days. But initially it was set up for primary school teachers in 1997, and I spoke about it at the um, Dean's Conference earlier this year. Um, <clears throat> what I've tried to do is to take some of the things that I've learned um, through teaching online as part of mixed media MMP um, and applied it to um, all of the classes I teach, whether they're face-to-face -face or online and whether they're at undergrad or master's level. So I've started to think of it less as online learning and more as blended learning. And so some of the ways that it happens is that um, the students in our mixed media program, they will come on campus for blocks of time, rather like the teaching days that other speakers have referred to. They'll come on campus for a week um, at a time, three times a year, throughout the three years of their degree. Uh, the rest of the time, they're located back in their regions. Um, we actually have some students who are from um, Dunedin. Why they study at Waikato, I have no idea, but they do. Um, but we have a lot from Taranaki, King Country, and from um, Northland as well. So they're spread throughout the entire length of the country. And um, they do their studies online, but they have one day a week in a base school. So they're practicing teaching throughout the entire three years of their degree, and that's additional to the blocks of practical time, practicum time that they have. It was really exciting when recently, probably in the last two or three years, the um, Bachelor of Teaching on campus decided that it was working so well having the students in base schools for one day um, a week that they, they would do it too. So they um, decided that one day a week the on-campus students would also go off and, and practice in schools and um, set up a, a new system called CUSP, which is about um, a partnership between schools and universities. Um, <clears throat> and I think what that illustrates is something that Som was, was saying in his keynote, and that is that really um, what happens in more traditional on-campus learning can be better if they, the face-to-face -face teachers, take a leaf out of our book. And instead of us being second best as distance educators, then it's more um, productive for the on-campus educators to learn a little bit about how we do it and to try and um, transform their practices in ways that are more aligned with the things that we've been doing for many years. Um, this semester for my sins, um, because just very much like the, uh, the, the journey that Karen was relating, we've been restructured as well renamed, restructured, and, and turned topsy-turvy, and there were a lot of redundancies in my faculty a few months ago. And so what happens after that is that those people who are left have to pick up all the teaching of the people who've gone. Uh, so I was asked for the first time in, in years, probably the first time in eight years, to teach a face-to-face -face course and uh, actually do some on-campus teaching. And I think they were really testing me to see whether I could still do it. And God, it was hard, you know. Uh, when I looked at this, this paper that they were asking me to teach, it was like a, a second year, 200 level option. And they said, right, um, the way it's timetabled is you've got a uh, two hour lecture on a Monday afternoon, and straight after that, you've got a two hour tutorial. And then on Tuesday morning, we want you to repeat that tutorial. And so they were proposing six hours of face to face contact time for those poor students with me. And I said, hell no, that's not going to happen. So what I said, I said, right, it so happened that the name of the paper was the Teaching Learning Appro uh, Process Innovative Approaches. And I thought, wow, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Innovative Approaches, right, we're going to ditch that six hours of contact time. We'll have a 90-minute um, slot 
where it's face to face and people come in and, and um, we do the class thing. And then after that, no tutorials, um, and we'll go online. And we'll do that, the dreaded asynchronous online discussion and stuff like that. Um, we'll have some videos, we'll have um, guests online, and um, I will ask you to prepare something for the week ahead, um, which is uh, flipped learning. Uh, <coughs> so you will have something to watch, something to read, or something to investigate, and something to discuss prior to next week's class. So basically, 90 minutes in class, and then you go away and you participate in a follow-up online discussion um, as in lieu of attendance at a tutorial. It's not assessed. We don't assess the online discussion. That's where the formative assessment happens, and it's the same as coming to class. Whether or not they turn up to the lecture on Monday is not assessed, so their contribution to online discussion throughout the week as a follow-up to the lecture is not assessed and they do their prep for the following week. That's um, uh, an attempt at blended and flipped learning, and I'll talk some more about what I've learned through that experience. Um, so the asynchronous online discussion is a tutorial, and as well as that, um, in all of the papers, I teach a master's paper in research methods, and for a lot of students, they're master's students, um, and it's educational research methods, so they're very often um, practicing teachers and principals. Um, they might not have studied for a while, similar profile to some of the students who Karen has um, discussed today, uh, and they also may never have taken an online course previously, and they're not taking this online research methods course because they want to um, study online. They're taking it because it's offered in B semester, it's only offered online in B semester, and they need it as a compulsory paper prior to doing their dissertation or master's thesis. So there's only three ways they can do it, and it's all about timing. If they do it in summer school, they can do it face-to-face, uh, -face, come on campus, and, and support it online. If they do it in a semester, they can do it face-to-face -face and come to lectures and tutorials. And if they, if they do it in B semester, then they have to do it online. And we typically get about 70 students in that paper every B semester. For them, um, they take part in online discussions as tutorials which aren't assessed. And, um, but they say they really miss the face-to-face -face and they will often um, telephone and want to talk things through. And so what I've started doing is um, offering a face-to-face uh, -face meeting prior to every assignment to talk about the assignment and talk about their research interests um, for those who can make it. And so we just have a little meeting on campus if they can make it. And if they can't make it, then they don't have to come. But I'll go straight upstairs to my office and um, podcast a summary of everything we've discussed so that they don't um, miss out on anything important. And they've started to say that they find those podcasts really, really helpful um, to the point where this time around they asked me to do it um, before the meeting rather than after the meeting. And I did. Um, and actually, put it up on YouTube and tweeted it out on the class hashtag and everything, and, and it got a little bit of interest from people who weren't studying in the course. <laughs> but they thought it sounded like a cool assignment. So, so that's some of the ways that we blend things and flip things, and I usually start my typical week with a video cast where I talk about um, what they have to do that week. Uh, foreshadow the week ahead and I'll give them some formative feedback on the, the week behind as well and say, well, this is, these were the key points from your online discussion that I picked up on and, and here's um, what you need to be doing this week. And um, then I encourage the students to organise Skype meetings with me if they want to talk about their work and their upcoming assessments. And they all have um, e-portfolios set up as part of their first semester, first year Bachelor of Teaching work. And so we give them formative feedback on the e-portfolios as they take shape over time as well. And that's how some of that happens. And as I say, increasingly we're inviting the students to use social media. Every class has its own hashtag. Um, and we have tweet chats where instead of meeting in Moodle or on Skype or appear in, we can meet on Twitter and, and um, chat as fast as our fingers will allow. 
and that also enables us to connect and teach the students how to connect with the wider professional community and to use Twitter as an avenue for ongoing professional learning and to learn about how to behave professionally in social media too um, with an element of e-professionalism in there. So we have some fun with that. For the students in our um, mixed media program, um, this diagram sums up where they're learning and how they're learning and where the support's coming from. And it's certainly not all coming from their lecturers. Um, they do a lot of learning on campus during those week, those blocks of time. They do a lot of learning in their base schools. Um, and some of them have to transition from perhaps being a teacher aide in that base school. Uh, and, and the principal and their teachers will say, you know, you're wasted as a teacher age, you really should become a teacher. And they say, oh, I can't, couldn't do that because I, couldn't, I can't go to university and, you know, we live um, at the back of beyond and there's the farm to think about and, and the kids. And, and then um, we will, they'll find out somehow, often from uh, the school having hosted another MMP student in the past, that they can indeed um, study from a distance as part of our program and the school will support them all the way through. Uh, and often when they come on campus they discover that there are other students who are from the same region, so they'll set up community groups um, and study groups, coffee groups, um, in their local area that are a massive support to them. Um, I've done some research about their, their perspectives and where they get their support and that's where this diagram came, comes from. They also find um, that the university support isn't restricted to the lecturers, as I say, and a huge source of support is, um, is the library. Um, we couldn't do what we do without the librarians. And I know that there are some library staff here today, and I just think that you know having a partnership with the library is absolutely essential, and um, our students say it time and time again. Uh, so. So the thing is, I guess, that while distance education um, is an obvious solution for those who are physically located away from the university's campus, it makes so much sense that it's a shame to leave it for those who are at a distance when there's so much that can be learned for those who do come on campus as well. And I know that um, I recently heard uh, Terry Anderson uh, speak and uh, give a keynote, and he said that really all of our students are learning in a blended way anyway. They're all on the internet the whole time, usually during class. And so if we harness the potential of that, then we're doing blended teaching as well. But whether we like it or not, the blended learning's already happening because they're making it happen. We can teach them to do it really well. So in, in these times of change, change, I think it's essential that we do try to harness that and that we do it with people in mind as well as efficiencies. And as something I alluded to earlier was that I think we're really fortunate because not only is the distance education model flexible for students, it's also really flexible for staff. Um, this was my situation about uh, 11 and a half years ago. That fella, that fella there is not quite 12, but he was 10 days old there. He's 11 and a half now. I was um, a single parent working full time uh, and it was, it was really tough. But I had three things that not all single parents had. I had education and qualifications. I had um, a flexible job where I could work from home. We were on dial-up at the time, but I could work from home. And I also had an employer who trusted me to get on with the job. And that meant that I could stay home and work around him, and then I could take him to campus crash for a few hours when I needed to go in for meetings and if I had to teach face-to-face. -face. And then, um, you know, it still works that way, that I can log in and check um, that the students are okay and engage in the online discussion, and then I can log out and switch off and go and do something else, whether it's going to his sports day or whether it's um, uh, doing some research. So I think that I'm really well supported for working online. And I recently went to um, the unions, the TEU um, conference in Wellington to talk about productivity and how I see it. 
and I said, really, um, if more of our colleagues would teach online, they, they would learn that that's one way to be productive as an academic because you can choose how to manage your time and shift your time and balance the demands of teaching, research, administration and service with actually having a life. <coughs> I've um, asked the students who, who study um, through our distance program, MMP, what are the biggest challenges and highlights for them of doing so. Um, I did a little study on it and I went back and spoke to some of the students from our very first intake um, who graduated um, class of 1997 to 1999. And it was really interesting, the pattern that emerged were that the challenges are identical to the highlights for them because when, when it works, it works. And when it doesn't, those are the things that fall down that need to be turned around. Um, the lack of support is a big challenge if they don't have it, but if they do have support, then it becomes a highlight. Um, we had some, um, there were some really horrendous stories about people who were studying in the late 90s, um, often rural women, um, many, many rural Maori women would study um, as part of MMP, and there were stories about this, the lecturer um, who was one of the inaugural research uh, lecturers on the program, told a story about a woman whose partner wasn't happy that she was doing this teacher education thing and that she was getting a bit above her station and that he wasn't getting the time that he needed from her. So that, so that he wouldn't feel disenfranchised, she used to get up in the middle of the night and put a towel over the computer monitor in herself so that she could type away without disturbing him. So um, it's, a, it's a horrible story to hear, but it's also really cool that that person that did graduate and did become a teacher and did change her life and the lives of her family by doing that. And that's where the challenge was the lack of support, but overcoming that lack of support and finding support in other places from her peers and from the university and from her school turned it into a, um, a, a highlight for her. Um, the academic challenges are the same, which again picks up on something that Kieran was saying. For staff, um, if you wanted to be online all the time, you could be. Um, and so there's a certain amount of um, self-management involved. And I wouldn't even say it's time management as much as self-management. Just get off the internet and you know leave it alone. You don't have to be there 24-7 just because you can. Um, it can also be a challenge to reach out to students and to get past that mindset that they're interacting with a, a computer keyboard and remind them that they are interacting with a person. And sometimes it's necessary to pick up the phone to make that connection. And that's where it can be really wonderful to meet with them on campus as well when it's possible. Um, some of the highlights for me have been the mentoring that I've received, as I say, from Nola Campbell and from others that Back in the days when the university could afford to staff papers with more than one lecturer teaching a paper and we had the opportunity to team teach, there is no better way to learn to teach online than to teach alongside someone who can teach you lots. Um, so that mentoring was huge and um, I've talked to you about the, um, the flexibility and the workload management that I've been able to achieve as a result of learning online, uh, teaching online. We'll jump to the second point there, because I think Tim might, um, might recognise it, that basically some of the students hate online discussion. They really do. And it's caused me to, because I've always I've got, had a long-standing addiction to online discussion, um, it's caused me to, to ponder the whys and wherefores of that and to look at creative ways of involving them in the discussion. A lot of them want synchronous interaction, so we tend to pepper it around throughout the semester. And it usually happens in small groups because, as Karen say, says, um, we can't do it at 4 a.m. necessarily, but it can be that students in the same time zone can cluster together and meet together online at the same time, and that um, we'll make it in there as staff when we can. Um, my experience uh, with making a Panopto video or a, um, a QuickTime podcast has shown me that if a picture paints a thousand words, then a video paints a million. And when I um, do a little screencast of, um, of the assignment and I, and I walk the students through it verbally and put that on YouTube, it just makes all the difference. 
they've been really quite categorical in telling us that from their first year, the two things that matter most for them about our online classes are the clarity and the presence. We have to be clear and we have to be there. And as long as we're clear about our expectations, we're clear about the way that we explain things, we're clear about what we're um, asking the students to do, and as long as we're there and respond to their queries within sort of 12 to 24 hours is what we aim for on a weekday, then they're happy. The students are happy and they feel supported and cared for. And I think that the, um, the videos that we make um, where we'll explain an assignment is where clarity meets presence because we'll explain it very clearly and communicate um, a, a personal perspective as well. So the next steps for me are, um, I've decided in this um, the face-to-face -face class that I'm teaching on Monday afternoon that I'm going to teach them how to engage in online discussion. I think there's a need for some direct teaching about it. The guidelines that I um, derived from my doctoral studies and stuck up online weren't really enough. Um, I need to actually show them what a good discussion looks like and talk them through the, the way that that works and what the criteria is like, um, and to invigorate it using um, role plays and debates. Um, one way to get them to disagree with each other is to put them into debating teams and tell them they have to disagree with each other, regardless of what they actually think. So we've been trying that for a while, um, and it does work. Uh, and so I want to bring more of that into my the, the blended and flipped class and to um, get those students doing more of those as well. And perhaps not surprisingly, um, one of the biggest challenges that we're facing at the moment is the actual physical space on campus. The class um, was timetabled, as I say, for those six hours in a lecture theatre, in a tiered lecture theatre. And it was actually quite a nice one. It was um, the lecture theatre where the Dean's Conference was um, uh, this year, and very nice. Uh, but it was a lecture theatre. It's quite difficult to get group work happening and, and more collaborative tasks happening in a lecture theatre. So I asked Timetable if we could please you know, have one of the nice rooms in the faculty and they said no. <laughs> so they gave us a room that's down the back of beyond at the other side of the campus and Waikato was quite a big campus and it's, it's called the, the J Building Basement. So I went off to find it, and I had to find the building, and then I had to go to the reception, because it's in, a, in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, and I asked the receptionist where it was, and she smirked and pointed me downstairs. And I went into the, so the room we've been given to replace the lecture theatre is this windowless, tomb-like little room. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's, that's what I'm going to be facing for my, my only face-to-face -face class next year. So. I would really like it if the university would invest in buildings. Um, if you haven't been to um, the University of Waikato, maybe you've been to um, Waikato Hospital. Uh, they're both really ugly. They were both designed um, about 40, 45 years ago. And um, architecture wasn't great at that time. So they're too young to be as beautiful as Otago. And, um, and they're, they're too old to be trendy. And when, when new buildings are built, they are um, they're built for, um, for law and management and engineering. And did you know that we're getting a medical school for some reason? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll leave you with those thoughts. And um, thank you for hosting me in Dunedin. Thanks, Diane. We've got one minute if anybody has an urgent question to ask. Okay, um, um, Diane's going to stay around for the dinner this evening, so um, if, you, if you are staying around for dinner and want to follow up with Diane about anything, um, take the opportunity. Thank you very much, Diane. Thank and, you. And for being here. Okay, that draws us to the end of today. Green, do you want to speak? What do you want me to say? <laughs> no, 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 I have not. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Lovely presentation. Yeah, and uh, if you go to dinner, and then we'll see you in dinner time, and then we'll have a chat, OK? <laughs> if anybody needs to be led over to the staff club, just say, because I know there's one or two of you who may not know exactly where the staff club is. But um, otherwise, hopefully, we'll see most of you over there. If not, see you tomorrow. <laughs>